sometimes it's so funny it hurts. The physical comedians who break it all down. They'll do anything to make them laugh. Make them laugh is made possible by Dorothy and Lewis B. Coleman, the Lewester T. Mertz Charitable Trust, the Star Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, because a great nation deserves great art, David E. Shaw and Beth Kobliner Shaw, the DuBose and Dorothy Hayward Memorial Fund, Marvin and Mary Davidson, Judith B. Resnick, the Vital Projects Fund, the Carson Family Charitable Trust, the Ira and Leonore Gershwin Philanthropic Fund, Susan R. Malloy and the Sun Hill Foundation, Buddy Teich, the Paul W. Zucker Foundation, the Seinfeld Family Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. From the very beginning of silent movies, comedians got knocked in the head, poked in the eye, and had buildings fall on top of them, all in pursuit of a laugh. They had to because in order to tell a joke in a silent movie, the audience had to read it. And considering what America's reading skills are now, you can imagine what it was like in 1909. Physical comedy is the oldest and most universal kind of comedy that we have. Of course, a lot of the greats started out on stage, in vaudeville or music halls. Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Laurel and Hardy. What's incredible in retrospect is they did their own stunts. I made a lot of movies and I don't even drive myself home. Now, all of these great artists said the same thing. It was the element of surprise that gave them their biggest laughs. The audience never knew. Wow! Who the hell left that open? Oh, episode three, physical comedy. What a cute little kisser. Watch me make him laugh. Zip, boom, kaboom. Oh, you don't know how to make a baby laugh. Watch this. You know, a lot of people now talk about physical comedy or slapstick, saying it's childish or it's infantile or it's primitive. It has certainly not gone away. All you gotta do is open your eyes and physical comedy is everywhere. The internet is a roiling pot of physical comedy. You've got tens of millions of video clips of nothing but people falling. There's stuff showing up and once in a while something really funny will come along. And a lot of it has to do with physical comedy. America's Funniest Home Video, a show that's been going on for decades in this country, is based upon the funniness of essentially physical things happening to people it shouldn't happen to. My guess is that Neanderthals in their caves were probably laughing at people slipping on saber-toothed tiger droppings or whatever. I think we're wired for this from the very beginning. No problem. Physical comedy, of course, is the zen, the most basic level of comedy. It's a deeper, different kind of laugh when when it falls down or when you're laughing at something physical. <laughs> physical comedy found incredibly rich soil in the new world, in the United States. That stuff is just in our bloodstream or our DNA in a different way, maybe. Europeans made silent films and they were some great cinematic stuff. Max Linder and cats like that, but they didn't have the kind of thing of violence and physical abandon that the American guys did. This country has been just a sea of voices for so long. You know, it's melting pot. Well, 
melting pot, you just think of that image, it's hot, it's bubbling, it's bubbling over. That's where things happen. That's primordial soup for comedy. Somebody falling is funny in German. It's funny in Yiddish. It's funny in Polish. It's someone getting squirted by a seltzer bottle. It's funny in any language. Comedy is a man in trouble. It's a great and useful idea. Let's just get into trouble and then get further into trouble and then try to get yourself out of trouble and think you're out of trouble and find out that you're in deeper trouble. Those are the rules. Well, Chaplin stumbled into this, this odd life. I mean, he literally fell into, into Hollywood and landed funny. In 1910, Fred Carnot's troupe of speechless comedians got off the boat from England. One of the performers was Charlie Chaplin, who played a drunk for great humorous effect. <laughs> In his very first film for Max Sennett's Keystone Film Company, he played a penniless dandy. In 1914, Chaplin went into the Keystone wardrobe department and emerged as the best known fictional character in the world. Well, at one time, people didn't say, let's go to the movies. They said, let's go see Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin was the movies. Chaplin became the most famous man in the world in one year. It was the beginning of movie merchandising. There were Charlie Chaplin dolls, Charlie Chaplin toys, Charlie Chaplin comic strips, Charlie Chaplin songs and sheet music sold everywhere. It was fame, unprecedented fame. Chaplin pretty much had a monopoly on the comedy field. And if theater owners couldn't get Chaplin films because they had contracts with different distributors, then they wanted Chaplin knockoffs. And so people produced Chaplin imitations. People went and pretended they were Charlie Chaplin when it's quite obvious they're not. When you see Chaplin, you know you're seeing a one-of-a-kind artist. For me, it all begins with Chaplin. He is the foundation of movie comedy. And everything extends outward from him. You watch his great comedies from 1916 and 17 that he made for Mutual, and they are as good as anything anybody has ever created on this planet. Mutual is like his comic laboratory. There he could experiment and do all the things. He could lavish the time on those 12 films that he made at Mutual.
elements of dance and playfulness that you see in his comedies started really in earnest at Mutual. That whole thing that he did on skates was, I think it's called The Rink, still fun to watch. You know, his dexterity was just amazing, you know. Part pantomimist, part acrobat. He had grace as well as a kind of a roughness, even crudeness, which he refined year by year. Never so much that he wasn't still that little tramp, man of the people. Who is the, the, the greatest comic? There's nobody uh, can answer that. It's a matter of taste. I'm willing to bet that a lot of people would go back to, say, Chaplin. That's a matter of taste. If Bill Fields said he's a dancer. <laughs> <laughs> Chaplin was graceful, as uh, W.C. Fields used to say, that damn ballet dancer. Never cared for him. The son of a bitch is a ballet dancer. He's the best damn ballet dancer in the world, and if I could get my hands on him, I'd strangle him. Chaplin was a funny thing in a regular world. Keaton was a still thing in a crazy world, <laughs> you know. The world was crazy around Keaton, and he just kind of sat there and kind of watched it go by. Keaton was way ahead of his time. And I think that's why his comedies stand up so well now. Well, I was born with a, a tent show on a one-night stand in Kansas. And it was called the Keaton Houdini Medicine Show Company. Now, that's Harry Houdini, the handcuff king. He was the doctor and, and trickster of the outfit. My old man was the entertainer and comic. And when I was six months old, we are in some little town, mall hotel, and I fell down a full flight of stairs. I sat up, shook my head, and shook it off, and didn't cry. And Houdini says, that was sure a buster. My father said, well, that would be a good name for him. By the age of five, Buster was one of the three Keatons, one of the most violent acts in vaudeville. He soon learned that the audience laughed loudest when he reacted with a deadpan expression. It became his signature. So the time I went into pictures when I was 21 years old, I started to get the name of Frozen Face, and Blank Pan, and things like that. We think of him as kind of the great stone face. But he just felt the connection with the audience when he was impassive. And, and people always wanted to get him to smile, you know. Buster, great idea. At the end of the film, you, you grin to the camera. You know, and he even tried it a couple of times. There's a couple of places on film where you see him trying it. And it's sort of painful. Keaton got into film through a chance meeting with Roscoe Arbuckle, who became his mentor. Roscoe Arbuckle was the second most popular comedian in the world. Later said that everything he knew about filmmaking, he learned from Arbuckle. Reportedly, the first thing that Keaton did after he got into the studio was ask if he could take the camera home. And he took it home, and he took it apart, and he put it back together again so that he would understand how it worked. Well, he was an athlete. He could have been in the Olympics. I, I saw him do things that no human being should be able to do. I went to visit him one afternoon, and he told me that he had broken, at one time or another, every bone in his body. fell off a train and broke his neck and kept working till the end of the day. What actually happened, and it's on camera, is that the force of the water slammed him down onto the tracks and broke his neck. But he didn't realize he'd broken his neck. He gets up and runs off. 
probably the most dangerous thing he did was the building falling in Steamboat Bill. It was arranged so that front of the building falls and a window comes around him. One Week was the first film that he released. At the end of the film, this house that he has built winds up having to get moved. So he's trying to get it across the railroad tracks. It gets stuck, and you see the train coming. One of the things Keaton did was he always had the universe of the comedy working within the frame. So anything that was outside the frame didn't exist. Keaton said, I always want the audience to outguess me, and then I'll double cross them. A joke you don't see coming. Chaplin's are very straightforward. It's just presented itself, that's what it was. Keaton's were a little more absurd, you know, a little more past the point of a joke, what we would call meta joke today, you know. When he was playing a projectionist in Sherlock Jr. and falls asleep, he dreams that he walks down the aisle of the theater up onto the stage and into the film. But once he's inside the film, he's now a victim of the editing. Keaton was a genius, but he was almost a mysterious genius. There's, a, there's an element of almost mystical quality about Buster. I think Buster was an alien. What he is in his films is a stranger in a strange land. He's observing this very bizarre universe. Keaton did something consistently, which is that he dealt with serious topics. He dealt with nightmares, dreams, and death on a regular basis. He was one of the first to explore the comic potential of the fears that we have about death and nightmares. In the late 1920s, Keaton's contract was sold to MGM, and he lost creative control of his work. Sound came in. New York stage directors, New York writers, dialogue writers all moved to Hollywood. So the minute they start laying out a script, they're looking for those funny lines, puns, little jokes, anything else. In the world of talking pictures, Keaton lost his equilibrium. His career never recovered, but for many, he remained the master of the slapstick gag. Now you stay there until I say turn. Turn. Good. Now look over there. Are you cranking? Turn. Dear ladies and gentlemen, Hal Roach presents for your entertainment and approval, Laurel and Hardy. Not every comedian had to run from the advent of sound movies. And one comedy team made the transition effortlessly. I think Laurel and Hardy were the greatest comedy team of all time because they created absolutely indelible characters and made you believe that's who they were. You never had a sense that Stan Laurel was playing a character named Stan Laurel or that Oliver Hardy was an actor portraying Oliver Hardy. You just believed them. They seemed real. Funnier than real people, but real. Is it now? You got my hat. What they had going in from silent to sound was the fact that their voices were really nigh on perfect for what they were. Now get back in that house and I don't want to hear any more out of you. You know, Ollie was this kind of southern gentleman who'd put on a few pounds, and Stan was this Englishman who was lost. 
He was lost no matter where he went. He was always just sort of lost. Are you from the South? I sure am. Well, fan my brow. I'm from the South. You are? Mm -hmm. Well, shut my mouth. I'm from the South, too. South of what, sir? The South of London. London. As much of a miracle it is that they teamed up, just serendipity, one from England, one from Georgia, how does that work? And yet it does. You just accept it, as audiences did in 1929. The genius of it was amazing, rooted in, you know, English Music Hall, as Stan was Charlie Chaplin's understudy. And yet there was a uniqueness about it that there's never been a team like that since. It was sort of like this. Ollie was the dumbest guy in the room, and Stan was his stooge, OK? It was really, it was zero-sum intelligence. The motto that Stan suggested for the Sons of the Desert, which is this Laurel and Hardy fan club, was two minds without a single thought. <laughs> and it's something kind of lovely about that. Hopeless, but charming. You know, it's a well-known fact that all the happiness in a home, when you have a baby and, and, and there's a wife and you and the baby, it's a well-known fact. I know, I've read about that. I'm beginning to think that you're right. They have this baby that they have somehow come, uh, taken responsibility for. Why don't you give it something to eat? And they're talking about the baby and what to do with it. As they're talking, they slowly become babies themselves. I tell you, I thought I was going to die. It was brilliant. You see them slowly become little tots. Their relationship was great. They cared about each other, and it was this affection. And no one ever thought about two guys in their 40s, you know, in night shirts, in bed together. They just, that's what they did. I think that these two guys teaming up to do what for most of us wouldn't be too difficult. Even in California, you can sell Christmas trees without destroying a man's house. But it's more fun if you destroy the man's house. It just is. It's watching the systematic destruction of property. It's all very systematic and just lovely. That's the house up there, right on top of the stoop. This is their job, is to get this piano up those stairs in Vendome Boulevard in Los Angeles. And just the frustration of having it get to the top and then finding its way back down again. Plus the fact that they have met and alienated the man they're delivering the piano to without knowing. Why don't you walk around? What, walk around? Me, Professor Theodore von Schwarzenhofer? When they came up against snooty people or pretentious people or wealthy people or any form of authority, it was there to be punctured in some way. And that goes back to Chaplin and all the other great clowns of that period. But you sort of identify with them. They weren't rich. They weren't from the upper classes. And you could still root for them. Don't you think you're bounding over your steps? What do you mean, bounding over my steps? <laughs> Why, he means uh, overstepping your bounds. <laughs> oh. It's easy to see that, as in most Laurel and Hardy films, it's not just the gags. It's not just the situations, but it's them performing those gags and them in those situations. Laurel and Hardy were as close as you could come to an animated film in those days. They were kind of magical. They defied gravity. They took terrible falls without dying. You know, just like Tom and Jerry or The Simpsons. I think there is something kind of eternal about great comic characters. They're indestructible. Wait a minute, I spit on me hands. All right. Oh! Oh! 
It's been over 50 years since their deaths. Why are they still walking around? Why are they still trying to get that damn piano up the stairs? It's because, you know, we, we share what they're doing. We know that they're doomed and that's why we're laughing. But we wouldn't have them stop trying for the world. Now, I don't get a laugh when I do that, but Dad did. We speak, we've already got a language, but this was Dad's language and his wonderful connection to the world of sound. How do you do? Harpo almost frustratingly won't speak, you know? And you're trying to get information out of it. And it's almost like he's having fun in this game of not speaking, of not using his voice. The fun is that, not that he can't, but that he won't. You gotta have the flesh. That's a flush. What are I gonna do with the flush? A flesh. No flitz. It's a flitz. What are I gonna do? Hey, flitz. What do you got, then? Eh? Yeah, what do you call a flutz? All you got is a fish and a flutes and a flitz and a flutes and a flitz and a flutes and a flitz and a flutes 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 Well, the Marx Brothers started out as a musical act called the Four Nightingales or the Three Nightingales or the Six Nightingales, however many nightingales they could find for a particular performance. But Dad did a lot of speaking at the time during the act, and one day he got a review that was stifling, and he was so crushed by the fact that the critic loved what he did physically, all the physical jokes and so forth, but when it came to speaking, he destroyed his own image. So Dad decided to just plain old quit talking. Say, what do you think you're doing? Holding up the building? Come on! The Marx Brothers were the first, you know, comedians of anarchy, you know, just to break down the establishment. I said passport, not pasteboard. Come on with a passport. Not washboard. It could be said that uh, Harpo is the most anarchic of the Marx Brothers. Cut the cards. Harpo had a very naughty quality. He's always chasing these women. He'd knock them over the head, you know. But you always felt the woman was safe with Harpo. There was something safe about it. There was just that quality that made you, you know, just think that it was fantasy, maybe. Well, the idea of this character who is such a ragamuffin and good for nothing and is always causing trouble, all of a sudden sitting down and doing a beautiful harp solo, it just drove audiences nuts. They just discovered this in vaudeville, that this worked, and they kept it. Dad's persona probably was best known for his coat and his hat. I have his coat. The coat that everybody remembers, that remembers Harpo. Here are all those crazy, weird little places that I had to put the carrot and the rubber duck and all these kinds of things. Say, buddy, could you help me out? I'd like to get a cup of coffee. <laughs> Young man, as you grow older, you'll find you can't find the candle at both ends. 
Right over here is this elongated sleeve, which I used to load 400 knives into, being very careful not to put them this way, but put them this way. You're running around with the wrong kind of people. You want to be a crook? Now, why don't you go home? He's got no home. Go home for a few nights and stay home. Don't you know your poor old mother sits there? Sits there night after, night after night, waiting to hear your steps on the stairs. And got no stairs. And I can see a little light burning in the, burning in the window. No, you can't. The gas company turned it off. Now, what I'm telling you is for your own sake. And if you listen to me, you can't hold on. This may go on for years. Now, there's just one thing. I can't understand what's delaying that coffee pot. The mirror scene, it was a slightly fantastic kind of a scene. To do a silent comedy scene in the middle of this very loud, talky comedy of 1933. Um, sound had only come to film a few years before, and now he was going to do a silent comedy scene and not have any musical accompaniment. And in fact, there's no sound effects. A real chimney pansy. That's no chimpy chump, that's a gorilla. Mo Howard put it once that he and the Stooges were different from Laurel and Hardy, mainly in the tempo. A lot of the same comedy, slaps, pratfalls, and that, only much faster. It was clip, 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 clip. Obviously, uh, Jewish kind of Yiddish rhythms. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. These mouse traps are dead. Oh, 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 oh. 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 They started almost at the advent of sound in films and went all the way to 1969. Uh, they put out over 20 movies and 200 plus uh, comedy shorts. Shut up! <laughs> Shut up! Let him alone! Sit down! I'm a victim of circumstance! Uh, who are you hitting? Oh. A lot of people may not like him, and there are probably a lot of fractured skulls of children around the country when they see it. Kids started emulating them, and parents became furious. You don't have to be afraid with that gun. Gun? Oh, is it loaded? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> there were times uh, on the set of their films where things went wrong, and they suffered their broken bones. Uh, Larry broke his nose. Mo broke his ribs. Uh, Curly, uh, he, he had problems with his ankle. Um, there were there were times when the Stooges were bloodied up and and that. Oh, oh. Wait a minute! This is getting monotonous. Oh, monotonous, eh? Oh, oh. A lot of people would call their brand of comedy violence. I think it's uh, well orchestrated violence. It's really slapstick at its purest, at its rawest. Boy, right on the head! Oh. 
sometimes they weren't as funny without the sound effects. I'm sorry, Mo, it was an accident. That really was a vital ingredient to their comedy. I don't want it. The main sound effects man at Columbia, this guy Joe Henry, he's been credited as the master there, who worked with the Stooges, and he had a full library of sound effects that were particular to just the Stooges, you know. He knew exactly what would work. But they used the sound effects to just blast it in your face and take it well beyond just a, a simple slap. Uh, take it into cartoon form, really. They took this raw comedy coupled with the sound effects, and it just hits people right where it needs to, right in the funny bone. studying at college? Pig Latin. Atwe arye uye uinde unite. You wouldn't know a thing about that, would you? Oh, all night. Lucy, 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 uh, put her up on the pedestal. First of all, she started out to be an actress. She did not become a comedian until late in life. She was a straight actress and a leading lady never quite worked and once she found what she could do just a minute this has gone far enough don't you know there are ladies present she made the pretty woman funny looking and that was great i think she had the courage because she knew basically she was pretty black out all my teeth because i know when i go home at night i'm still going to be a cutie pie people would accept her as the redhead you know who was just the beautiful chorus girl and so that when she finally showed that she could be a nutty and madcap and goofy and crazy despite the look then that was a real breakthrough well she wasn't afraid and she unlike many of the comedians of the day and today don't mind looking silly and, and not looking pretty all the comedians like to look pretty stars like to look pretty so sometimes you can get comedy out of them lucy was the first one said you can look like this and still be pretty when you go out after the show she was not funny in private life she learned it and she studied it i'm never on at parties First of all, I'm not that talented. I really, I mean it. I'm not just saying I don't sing, I don't dance for parties, and I dance and do those things after a lot of rehearsal and after something a writer has given me, but I don't go around with a stack of jokes and funny sayings. I was the assistant director on I Love Lucy, and we did hour shows. And there was this scene where Red Skelton is playing the bum character, and Lucy is another bum, and they're in a freight train, and he's got a pantomime eating a meal, and Lucy has to do exactly the same. And she said, how do you do that? And he said, I don't know, I just do it. You know, you pretend there's a glass and you pick it up and you cut the meat. Blah. She said, no, no, you have to show me step by step what you do. So for about two hours, Red Skelton broke down and he would show her every move he would pantomime. By the end of the two hours, she was absolutely as good as he is. <laughs> She did kind of the Buster Keaton thing where she could work with her face and her body. I mean, a lot of comedians can do this or something, but then the rest of them is still, but she could kick and flail and still have a funny face. She went for it. She went to Buster Keaton to learn how to use props. Now, how brilliant is that? Show me. Show me, I want to do this right. I worked with her, and when we were reading the scripts, she would say to me, after that line, count to two before you say the next line, because that's how long the laugh will be, and she was right. She was a master craftswoman, master at what she did. Yeah. 
a lot of people are not aware of the fact that it was a stretch for my dad to do the mirror scene because he did Groucho's part and Lucy did Harpo's part. With Lucy, he felt a, a kindred spirit there. I remember her persona was so much like Harpo's. Impulsive behavior, honest behavior, human behavior. And I think that that's what really comes across in the mirror sequence. As more and more comedians relied on scripted dialogue, one inspired lunatic began his career by playing dumb. When he started out, he had a wind-up record player, and he would lip-sync records. He was a teenager then, and lived in New Jersey, and played club dates. That's all he would do. He never said a word. He'd walk in, set this thing up, and put in a... Uh, be my love or one of those things and mouth the whole thing and pack it up and go home. That was a club date. I wanted so much to do physical, visual comedy. And at 14, I didn't have that many options. So I was doing a record act and it enabled me to do facial expressions and physical movement. It was a great act to get started in. So Jerry was totally physical. He was totally, completely physical. In his words, he was a dumb act. Lewis became a regular in the upstate New York resort circuit known as the Borscht Belt. But in July of 1946, he found himself stranded at an Atlantic City joint without a singer on the bill and remembered a crooner he had once met in a coffee shop. I was sitting at the counter having a very loose egg salad sandwich, and I bite the sandwich, and most of the egg salad is now on my shirt and tie. And I look around, and there's this handsome guy sitting there, <laughs> hysterical. He said, lick it. I, I licked it. What else do you want? Are you fixed for spit? And we met that way. And I knew the moment I looked at him that I found that big brother. Together, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis immediately took the post-war nightclub world by storm. There was never been an act like it. The combination of those two guys, I don't know what it was, but it, it had class and it had pace, and you couldn't take your eyes off them. Jerry was the best when he was with Dean. They bounced off each other. Incredible act. <laughs> The audience doesn't believe the straight man. They're not going to be the comedian. The comedian can be over the top, over the edge, but if that straight man plays it as if it's true, it gives a cue to the audience. I mean, how can you actually believe that Jerry Lewis was really that wacko? But here is Dean Martin absolutely playing it as it's true. But Dean Martin was genuinely funny, and Jerry helped that. Jerry brought that all out. 
Jerry knows music and choreography. Jerry, if anybody could be too talented, it would have been Jerry. They filled a cultural gap. You know, the war really took it out of everyone, and these guys came along with this anarchical, amazing take on destroying all the conventions of, of show business. Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis were the highest grossing act in their heyday in the entire history of show business. When they appeared at the Paramount Theater, they had maybe 25,000 people there at 7 o'clock in the morning looking to buy tickets there, but 500 policemen with whips <laughs> whipping the people into place. They were gigantic. They were just gigantic. My boy, oblige with autograph photographs, and the rush and the crush provide a spectacle unprecedented even for Times Square. Martin and Lewis even invite their fans upstairs, says Jerry. I tell you what, you want to come up for Broadway? We ain't got any. What'd you come to see? Oh, <laughs> oh that's swell. <laughs> Along with turning their onstage clowning into two movies a year for Paramount Pictures, they were constantly in the public eye. Another highlight of the evening for Martin and Lewis is a word of praise from their boss at Paramount Pictures. We have recently become partners. You know that pretty well, Mr. Steve. Thank you. I know. <laughs> I Did don't... you bring the money oh, with you? <laughs> On television, they were hosting the Colgate Comedy Hour. Ultimately, it all became too much. I'm going to get even with you. I don't know how. I don't know when. But someday yes. I'll get even with you. Boy, yes. you'll be cybertreat me. I try to help you. The breakup was so obvious to anybody who really followed their career and knew about them. Well, the breakup was inevitable. The most underestimated great talent in the history of show business was Dean. He took it for 10 years. Jerry this, Jerry's the guy, Jerry's this, the silly kid, Jerry. Jerry, Jerry's the businessman, Jerry operates, the, he writes, produces, whatever, and it was always Jerry. And I went to Dean and I said, look, we're not getting along now only because there's some undercurrent here where you would like to just step out and be acknowledged as an individual performer with talent, and you are. And I want to do some other things too. Let's just, let's just wrap it up. In 1959, Lewis signed the most lucrative contract ever offered to a performer. $10 million up front and 60% of the net profits for a series of Paramount comedies. His work was so successful that one Paramount executive said, if Jerry Lewis wanted to burn down the studio, I'd give him the match. He wrote it, he produced it, he directed it, he starred in it, he invented video assist, he's the first person to have monitors on the set so he could direct himself. He was the total filmmaker. He got to the point where he decided he could do everything, that he was, he was the new Chaplin. He'd do it all himself. He didn't realize that when Chaplin did it all himself, he took months and months to do a picture. He wanted to do it quickly, 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 fast, fast, get it done. You can't attach to him normal human traits. They're not normal people. And when we somehow get disappointed if Jerry gets a little bit crazy, that's what he is. You know, you, 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 can't, <laughs> you can't expect a racehorse to fly. One of my heroes, Jerry Lewis, um, was a precursor to many of us. I think myself, uh, Jim Carrey, Dean and Jerry, Dean and Jerry, were a twosome extraordinary. He was like a brother, now you just get one. You just get one without the other. I first met Jim Carrey when I think he was 19, and he came into the comedy store and did the most unbelievable impressions. James Dean. He really has a way of switching, I don't know, his position and his personality like a cartoon. He can do it so almost you didn't see the frame in which he did it. I, I, how does he do that? So this is one transition. <laughs> and this is another. 
Now recognized as one of the most versatile actors of his generation, Jim Carrey was born in Canada and started his career as a stand-up. I used to go on the road with him and open up for him. I, you know, I would feel terrible watching him because I would be there kind of stiff doing my act the whole time. And, and Jim was just, you know, falling and flipping over backwards and shape-shifting on stage. So don't do this. Oh, he's such a rubber-faced guy. He's just, he's a great combination of being a, you know, a good actor and an extremely funny guy. When I saw him in Living Color, I couldn't wait to see every week. I just looked forward to it. What's inside? <gasps> it's beef. <laughs> Somebody catch me. <laughs> I love being in sketches with him because I wanted to be there with him and watch him experiment. Watch him work. You know, he was like a, he was like Dr. Frankenstein. Nice to meet you, folks. Fire Marshal Bill here. Won't you come in? Fire Marshal Bill was uh, one of the things that, like, he would change his whole face. Let me tell you guys something. Let's just say. Hey, Fire Marshal Bill, your fingers on fire. Yeah, that's nothing. I caught fire so many times I can't even feel it anymore. When he threw his face, it looked like he was in a fire accident. I'm like, how does he do that? How does he even know to do that? You know. He's one of those guys that's just walking the halls of his house in the middle of the night, coming up with great ideas. Ha, ha, ha. I have exercised the demons. This house is clear. What do you know about Ray Finkel? Soccer style kicker, graduated from Collier High, June 1976, Stetson University Honors graduate, class of 1980, holds two NCAA Division I records, one for most points in a season, one for distance, former nicknamed the Mule, the first and only pro athlete ever to come out of Collier County, and one hell of a model American. <laughs> in 1994, Jim Carrey became a major movie star, first in Ace Ventura, and then as Stanley Ipkiss in The Mask, which unleashed Carrey's talents in tandem with a host of special effects. I don't think he starts with, with the physical. I think that he, he's really a deep thinker. When it comes out of him, it just becomes something else. Look, I'm not here to twist your niblets. I'm here to save your life. But if I'm going to do that, I'll need total union and anonymity. Ever been rich, lad? Huh? Huh? I'm going to kill you, I can swear to God! You know, he doesn't care what somebody thinks. He just goes for it 110%. Hello, Mama. How about this? Oh, yeah. He told me one time, he said, no one knows what's really going to be funny, man. You know, all we can do is the best we can do. You know, but we're the ones that got to be willing to throw it onto Earth. Well, I, I'm happy to see somebody doing the kind of broad things that Jim Carrey is doing, simply because the, it seemed to be going away, disappearing. He would have been a big star in the 20s, <laughs> in silence. He really has that ability. You know, they always say the cockroach will be the last thing to die. You know, the comet can hit the earth, the nuclear bombs can go off. I think the same is probably true of slapstick. I am convinced it was the first comedy to emerge, and I am more than convinced that it will be the last one to die. Courageous comics who defy conventions. Dirty Lenny, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Never tell a comedian not to do something. Because sure enough, they'll probably do it. They'll do anything to make them laugh. Richard Pryor running down the street. <laughs>
Visit PBS.org for more fun from your favorite make em laugh comedy stars. And take a look at the funny business of online comedy. The entire make em laugh series is available on DVD for $34.95. A companion book is available for $45. To order, call 1-800-336-1917 or write to the address on your screen. Make Em Laugh is made possible by Dorothy and Lewis B. Coleman, the Lewester T. Mertz Charitable Trust, the Star Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, because a great nation deserves great art. David E. Shaw and Beth Kobliner Shaw. The DuBose and Dorothy Hayward Memorial Fund. Marvin and Mary Davidson. Judith B. Resnick. The Vital Projects Fund. The Carson Family Charitable Trust. The Ira and Leonore Gershwin Philanthropic Fund. Susan R. Malloy and the Sun Hill Foundation. Buddy Teich. The Paul W. Zucker Foundation. The Seinfeld Family Foundation. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. We are PBS. This fall, filmmaker Ken Burns will be your guide on a journey over a century long and a continent wide. A trail blazed by pioneers, marked by milestones, and adorned with the most breathtaking views on Earth. Come explore America at its best, the national parks. Coming soon to Georgia Public Broadcasting. Good morning, Georgia. You're listening to your source for great music and NPR news. It is the policy of the Georgia Public Telecommunications Commission not to discriminate on the basis of political or religious opinions or affiliation, race, color, sex, age, physical handicap, or national origin. The Georgia Public Telecommunications Commission is an equal opportunity employer. How do you spend your Saturday nights then? No, don't tell me. Try the Brick Coms. An evening dedicated to wacky, silly, yeah. oddball, just plain funny comedies. So let's recap. The Britcoms. Timeless comedy packaged for freshness. Saturdays at 8 on GPB. The fact that PBS is the most trusted media outlet in the country means a great deal to me. We live now in the most multicultural America ever. There are a lot of voices in this country that need to be heard. I think that my job is to introduce Americans to each other, and we take that challenge seriously every day. After failed, disastrous missions, the dream to land on the moon was about to come true. With Apollo 11 on July 20th, 1969, Look back at one of the greatest achievements in space history when Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins the angle has landed. became American heroes on Apollo 11, First Steps on the Moon. Tuesday at 10 on Georgia Public Broadcasting. GPB Radio is your source for Georgia's most trustworthy news coverage with award-winning journalists from NPR in Washington and right here in GPB's Georgia News Center. Whether it's morning edition on your way to work or all things considered on your way home, GPB Radio keeps you informed. For more information or a coverage map, go to gpb.org. Let's say you're a couch potato. What if there were a drug that could transform you from this to this? Exercise in a pill? The mouse does burn more fat. On Nova Science Now. Tuesday at 9 on Georgia Public Broadcasting. On Nova, the Parthenon, revered icon of Western civilization. A powerful statement of what human beings are capable of. How did the ancients build it? Very simply, but ingeniously. Nova uncovers clues trapped in stone. Here lies the DNA of the Parthenon. Secrets of the Parthenon on Nova. Tuesday at 8 on Georgia Public Broadcasting. This is Georgia Public Broadcasting, your PBS station serving all of Georgia.
Roanoke Island in North Carolina is the site of one of the big mysteries in American history. 